We're now ready to look at a full PID example. Because this process is a bit long, we're gonna split the example up into a few different smaller videos. So in this example, we want to design a PID controller so that this system below, given by the block diagram here, operates with a peak time that is two thirds that of the uncompensated system at 20% overshoot and with zero steady state error for a step input. And so we notice that this is a type zero system based on this G of S block. And so what that means is of course, we're gonna to have to have our PI compensation to increase our system type. And of course, we're also going to have to adjust our transient response to make that quicker. So that's where our PD compensation is coming in. And so we're gonna follow the basic steps that we laid out in the previous video. So in this first video, we're gonna look at step one, which is going to be characterizing our uncompensated system. So step one is to characterize or evaluate our uncompensated system. And of course we need to have some sort of starting point before we, we start adjusting the system. So a couple of things that we can talk about. First of all, let's look at this 20% overshoot. So we're not gonna go through the details of that, but of course we could use that same equation that we've seen before to relate our percent overshoot and our damping ratio. And we see that this corresponds to a damping ratio that's approximately 0.456. So the next thing that we wanna find is we wanna figure out our, uh, our peak time, of course, because that's what we want to reduce by two thirds. Let's go ahead and just plot our full root locus. From there, we can find our dominant poles that intersect this damping ratio line. And from there, we can talk about our peak time as well as our settling time and some other parameters. So let's go ahead and come down here and plot that root locus. And so this is gonna be a good chance to get some practice uh, just sort of plotting again as well. So looking at our GFS, we see we have a zero at eight and a pole, uh, the highest pole is at negative 10, sorry, negative eight and negative 10. So let's go ahead and, and sketch out enough space here. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, didn't quite give myself enough space, so let's go ahead and label that negative two, four, six, eight, and 10. Okay, so we know that we had a zero at negative eight, so let's put our open loop zero at negative eight. We had open loop poles at three places, at negative three, at negative six, and at negative 10. And so what we can see from this is that we have, um, we have three open loop poles and one open loop zero. So what that tells us is we have two infinite zeros, or in other words, we're going to have two asymptotes. And so because there's two asymptotes, they're going to be at 90 degrees and positive 90 degrees and negative 90 degrees with the real axis. Uh, we're not gonna go into the details of calculating the exact intersection point or anything like that, um, but you certainly could if you wanted to refine this a little more. So the next thing that we can do is we can plot where our root locus is on the real axis. So of course it has to be to the left of an odd number of these finite open loop poles or zeros. So we see it's going to be on the real axis here and it's going to be on the real axis here. Um, so of course this pole that starts at negative 10 is going towards negative eight. So that's just sort of a self-contained little system over there. And then at some point between negative six and negative three, we're going to have a breakaway point and so maybe it looks something a little bit like this. And so again, I'm not necessarily um, drawing this super accurately. We could refine this a little bit. And in fact, the numbers that I'm going to give you here in a little bit are coming from a MATLAB simulation. Uh, so we get something that looks like this. And so of course I've sort of had these implied asymptotes uh, that are somewhere like this. And so what we're looking for as well is our intersection with our damping ratio line. So we have some damping ratio line along here. And so this is our damping ratio line for zeta equals 0 0.456. Now, of course, we're interested in the intersection of those two. And so if we use MATLAB, we can do all of the functions we've talked about before. So we can do our root, sorry, we can plot it with our locus after we've entered the transfer function G. We can then do S grid, S grid, with our zeta and zero to plot that damping ratio line, our radial line. And then we can use our loc find in order to determine the exact intersection point by interacting with the graph. 
So this is a good point for me to mention. At the time of making this video, the notes in Canvas have numbers that were based on an older octave code. I've since gone back and updated that to get more accurate values using MATLAB. So if you see some slight discrepancies between what's in this video and what's in the notes on Canvas, that's the reason. Uh, so this example is also in the textbook, so you can also compare to those values as well. Okay, so if we go through this process though, using MATLAB to find the exact position of that pole, we find that our dominant poles, so dominant poles are going to be at negative, uh, let's see, make sure I do the right values here, negative 5.416 plus or minus J10.572. So those are going to be our two dominant poles. So of course, the one is up here. As I've indicated, we're going to have a complex conjugate down here. And it turns out, of course, we have a third pole, which is over here between our negative 10 and negative 8. So our third pole location ends up being at negative 8.169. So very close to this zero here. And so what we can say then is that we approximately have that canceling out with a zero. So approximately cancels with our zero. And what that means is that our second order approximation is appropriate. So second order approximation, okay. Uh, the one other piece of information that we get from this rlocfind function is the gain that gives us that position. So of course, you know, our closed loop poles are starting here and then they're moving along this way and then it's moving up this way until eventually we get to our desired location. And in this case, we find that our gain to get this point is approximately 121.57. Now, keep in mind, of course, there is some uh, degree of error introduced based on the resolution I use when I plot this root locus. There is also some degree of error introduced by the user as we are selecting that point manually on the plot with the rloc find function. So if you go through this example yourself, you might end up getting numbers that are slightly different, but of course they should be more or less the same. Okay, so now that we know we can use our second order approximation and we know the location of our dominant poles, we can talk about some of our time response characteristics. So let's start by looking at our settling time. So we know from the settling time, we're, we're using the real part of our dominant poles. And we can say our settling time is equal to approximately four divided by the magnitude of that real part. And so coming up here, we saw that that real part is negative 5.416. So I can divide this by 5.416. And I get that my settling time is approximately 0.739 seconds. Okay, and then from the imaginary part, I can get peak time information. So our peak time T sub P is approximately equal to pi divided by the imaginary part of our dominant pole. And so that's going to be approximately pi divided by, and up here we see we had for our imaginary part 10.572. So let's put 10.572 there. Evaluating that, we get a peak time of approximately 0.297 seconds. Okay, so that's going to be of interest here in a second because of course that's what we want to adjust. Um, so now what we can also talk about is our steady state error. So let's go ahead and talk about our KP. So we said this is a type zero system, so our KP is our static error of interest. And so that of course is just equal to the limit as S goes to zero of G of S. And if we plug that in uh, from our block diagram, we can see all of those terms with S are going to zero. We wanna make sure we don't forget to include this K value. And so that was the gain of about 121 that we found a second ago. And we're gonna have that K times eight divided by three times six times 10. So let's come down here and write that. And so again, there's that gain value of 121.57. So we have K times eight divided by three times six times 10. And so if we plug that in, we get that that is approximately 5.403. And for a type zero system, remember our steady state error is just going to be given by one divided by one plus KP. So plugging in that value of KP from above, we get a steady state error of about 0.156. And so 
we'll come back and talk about that and we'll see how our transient design is going to affect that. So we're gonna stop here for this first video. So just looking at step one, uh, our next video, we're gonna start with step two, which is going to be to design our PD controller. And remember our goal with our PD controller is going to be adjust our transient response. So we're gonna to wanna to adjust this to two thirds of this original value as determined by the problem statement.